Hey guys, what's up? Serena Pia here from thriftdiving.com and today I'm super excited because we are laying new flooring. We have 34 cases. Trust me, these were very, very heavy. 34 cases, my wrist still hurts, of vinyl plank flooring and this stuff is gonna go down over top of the linoleum tile that's in here now. Everything is painted fresh and I am just ready to feel like this is a nice, beautiful, welcoming, lower level office space. So the first thing we have to do is actually clean this floor. We don't wanna have any dirt on the floor, any dust, because if that gets into the planks, it's not going to snap together very well. So we gotta do some cleaning first, and then we're ready to get started. So let's do this, because I'm ready to see what this floor is gonna look like. So let's jump into it right now. So before we jump into the actual tutorial, let me tell you why this flooring was perfect for my basement and why you might wanna consider this too. This is by LifeProof. It's a, they call it a luxury vinyl tile. And what I liked about it is that I could put it directly over the basement floor. I didn't have to add any underlayment because you see it here already attached on the back. That's the black rubbery type, you know, soft material that's on the back. I also liked that it had different sizes of planks and so I could kind of figure out the pattern that I wanted to lay down. And I liked that it had the various shades. So it gave my floor a little bit more depth. So if you wanna install this over vinyl, wood, tile, concrete, it goes over it very well and it's waterproof. So it's not going to you know, disintegrate if you have some sort of water leak in your basement, you know, big storm comes. So let's talk about what you need once you decide you wanna use this, what you actually need to do first. You have to take your measurements. So for this, you need the length of your room and you wanna divide that by the length of the tile. Now the tiles I was using, was 47 and a half inches, and that will give you the actual number of tiles or planks that you need per length of the row. So for my basement, I put the numbers in and came up with the fact that I need six planks, six full planks, and 0.99 of a another plank, that would be plank number seven. The reason why this is important is because you don't wanna to get to the end of the row and have a short piece. You need to read the instructions before you get started, but they say, you wanna have each of your boards be at least eight inches. So the same is true for the width. You wanna take the width of the room and divide it by the width of the tile, and that'll tell you how many planks you need to span the width of your room. So my math showed that I needed 57.64 planks. That means 57 full width planks and 0.64 will be the size of the very last plank width. Now here's what we do with that 0.64. We times it by the width of the plank. That will tell us in inches what the size of that last plank will be. Here's what's important about that. If that number, here in my case it's 3.52, if that number is less than half the width of the plank, so in my case it has to be at least two inches and three quarter. If it is less, we need to make some adjustments. So that first plank you lay down can't be a full plank. You need to cut it down a little and make sure that it evens out the room layout. Otherwise, you'll end up with a final piece that's one inch, two inch, and it'll look very weird. We don't want our room to look weird. All right, so you need your square footage as well. Multiply the length and width of your room and add 10% for mistakes. Click Calculate on the Home Depot website. It'll tell you exactly how many cases you need. Step two, you probably need to trim the molding around your door. So line a piece of the molding up to the door trim and you wanna trim it flush, do a nice little flush cut or you can use a rotary tool. I'm using a little handsaw here. Your door may need to be cut too if it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't clear the new flooring. If it does, take it off, cut it with a circular saw. But in this case, all we needed to do was trim the trim around the door and the floor fits perfectly. So for step three, we are ready to plan our first row of planking. And there's a few things you have to keep in mind. This is the most difficult row to get started because it will shift around on you. you are to, you're supposed to keep a one quarter inch gap spacing along the perimeter of this flooring. You'll see here that I'm laying these quarter inch spacers, but they were difficult to use. They kept shifting around. And I'm sorry, my butt is in your face. <laughs> I didn't realize this until after I sat down to edit the video. So we're just gonna have to look aside from my butt. All right, so once you lay your first row of flooring or plan it out, this is what may happen. If you get to the final plank 
on your first row and you notice that that plank is less than eight inches, then you have to come back to your first board like I did here and you need to trim that. This one I trimmed to 14 inches. And by doing that, it allowed my last board to be greater than eight inches. So as confusing as that sounds, just be sure to plan out that first row. And if you need to make trims, it's pretty easy to do. If you have a speed square and a box cutter, you're literally just scoring the top maybe two or three times and then flipping that board over and snapping it. And all of my boards for the most part snapped right off, a nice clean cut. That, that cut edge is the cut edge that will go against the wall, well, with the quarter inch spacer. All right, so make sure that you leave that cut edge at the top and then you can finish completing your row. You may find that it's easier to move that first row away from the wall a little bit. And then once the entire row is complete, then you can move it back into position. Now here's what's very important. You're gonna need to use a tapping block. Now this is not a tapping block. It was a piece of scrap trim that I used and it ended up leaving all of these gaps in the wood. That tapping block is supposed to push these boards together so it's nice, tight, and secure. And so make sure you're using all the right tools and materials. You can find the materials list down below. So let's talk about how you actually put this together. This is a really secure flooring. It's got these grooves that it just fits together like a puzzle. And each piece is supposed to be angled at a 45 degree angle. And then you slide it up until it touches the next piece and then push it down with your fingers. And you might even hear a snap. So then before you actually mallet it into position, you wanna use the mallet with the tapping block. This helps to like ease out any of that space between the planks. And you can see it coming together to know that it's tight. But here's the thing, it has to be right on the edge of the plank. It cannot be against that rubber foam part because I made this mistake several times and look what happened. It actually broke the edge of the foam. So you don't wanna do that because then you can't use that board. So then once it's in position, you can use your mallet and tap that seam nice and tight. Okay, so now we can move on to step four, which is planning out the other rows. So here's what we have to keep in mind. With vinyl plank flooring, you wanna make sure that your seams are at least eight inches apart. So that means you're gonna to have to stagger these boards. Now, because we're using multi-width planks, it makes it a little different. Plus they're different colors. And so you don't wanna stack all the same colors together. So take a little bit of time and just lay out a couple rows at a time, making sure that you like where the colors are, making sure that you like the seams. And if it looks like it looks pretty good to you, then you can proceed with actually laying them down. Now here's what you need to do in order to stagger your seams. You will need to make some cuts at the beginning and end of your row. So here's how I did my measuring. I took that second board that I wanted to be in the row and placed it on top to get an idea of where I needed to make that cut. So in this case, let's say I measure from the wall to my finger and that's 20 inches. Well then what I did was I flipped that tape measure around and measured from that end to where my finger was, which was 20 inches, for example, and then made that cut. So what this allowed me to do is to cut off the part that's closest to the wall, which was the scrap part. And the part that's cut, that's what we want against the wall. You do not want your cut piece anywhere on the other side because then you're not gonna be able to connect it. You need those little foam connectors. So keep that in mind. I guarantee you will cut at least one or two pieces <laughs> and you're like, oh, I think I cut the wrong side. <laughs> it's very easy to do. Don't, you know, don't get all worked up if you do that mistake. It happened to me a couple of times, but that's how you measure and that's how you do it, whether you're cutting at the beginning of the row or you're cutting at the end of the row. You will need to make some cuts, but again, when you're making those cuts, make sure that you know there is at least eight inches between those seams before you actually make your cuts. This will save you a lot of scrap material. And here's a really good tip. If you've got a lot of furniture in your room, don't feel that you've got to move everything out. Shift it over to the side of the room, do you know a few feet of flooring, and then once you've got enough space, you can start shifting things back onto the new floor. And this is actually good because it helps to hold the floor in place when you are tapping it, trying to make sure that it's connected. And here's another little tip. Try to get the kids involved, get your husband, your spouse involved. I did it for the most part myself, but when Kojo helped, he's only seven, it actually did move a lot faster. He clicked it together. Now, trying to show him how to mallet 
it no, that part didn't work too well. But he came behind me and tacked them down with the mallet and it, it went pretty quickly. A lot of times the kids just got in the way. They wanted to argue about who was going to use the mallet and then they wanted to have a dance competition. So I just kind of joined in, did my thing at the other end of the room and let them have at it. But for the most part, it was a fun time and when they did help, it actually made it go faster. All right, so let's talk about the layout of the floor. Now the LifeProof multi, multi-sized different color pack, it requires a little bit more attention. You know, it's not all the same color. So here's what you have to do and here's what I found worked well for me. I grouped the boards as best as I could into different piles. So you see I've got the 10 inch boards, the larger ones lying together, the medium five and a half inch boards were in their own stack and then the skinnier four and a half inch boards were in their stack. And so what helped, as I mentioned before, is laying out a few rows and then taking a step back to see, does this look right? Are the light boards too bunched together or do maybe I need to space them out? And so there's no rhyme or reason, there's no right or wrong way to lay these boards, but you wanna make sure that that it looks good. When you stand back, your eye isn't drawn to one particular area that looks funny. And so spend a lot of time doing that because you'll wanna make sure you're not having to pull this up after you have made the connections on the boards. You could rip that little foam part very easily if you make a mistake. So by all means, take time, like I'm doing here, to lay it out so that you don't make any mistakes. So again, I'm gonna cover how I planned out the beginning of a row. So I'd lay down the boards that I wanted to come first, again, making sure that that seam is staggered. I would lay the other board on top, making sure there's at least eight inches between that one seam and the new seam, and I would measure. So in this case, it was 12 inches, we're good to go. So I'd measure from the wall to where that second plank would start. So we're at about 24 inches. So I'd move this second plank out of the way, take my tape measure and measure up from the bottom of the plank to that 24 inch mark. So using my utility knife, I'd just hold it there in place and then score it a few times using the empire square. It's a little difficult to score this without an empire square. You definitely need something to keep it straight. You can use a ruler. Just make sure you're not freehanding it because it will move around on you. Now I'm really digging into the tile. You don't have to do it that hard and that often. One or two scores across the top, it's unbelievable, but it will still snap. So if you turn it over, hold your hand against the where the, the scoring line is, it should snap for you pretty easily. And then we're just moving that up into position. Now I'm gonna cut the other board in the same position. Actually, I think I've got this one at 23 and a half. I'll score it a couple of times like I did the other board, turn it over and snap it. Now we've got the two boards that we're gonna to use to start this new row. So making sure that you keep a quarter inch spacer at the end of the row, you'll put it in at 45 degrees, make sure that it's in there nice and flat. And if you've got it in there right, it should lay flat for you. If the board is raising up a little, it means it's not connected very well. And again, you'll use your mallet and your tapping block to give it a few taps along the entire width of the board, the, the entire length of the board. And you wanna make sure, again, you're not tapping it on the edge of where that connector is. So you'll attach the other board, and here's something to be very careful of. Make sure that they are even where my left hand is. Make sure that they are nice and even, because if they're not, the other board, when you attach it, will not be even as well. It will leave a gap. So just be very mindful, take your time, and don't rush through it. The next board should be going in pretty easily at 45 degrees, and then slide it up until it touches the, ne the next board, and gently put it down, making sure that that seam is nice and tight. And then you'll be able to use your mallet and your tapping block, as I've shown you before. And then once those have been pushed together, then you would just tap the seams and then that's it. Well, that's not totally it because we still need to cover how do you make irregular cuts around corners because you will have at least a few corners in your home. So we're gonna cover that in just a moment, but I wanted to tell you about the time you can expect for a project like this. It took me about probably five to six days to do this. You wanna expect three to seven days, depending on the scope of your project. If you are removing baseboards, you'll wanna add in a little additional time for that. 
If you're putting new baseboards on, that will take additional time. I wanted to put an additional coat of paint in my office, so you wanna do all of that before you put your floor down. So let's move on to step six, making irregular cuts around corners. Now I'm gonna share with you some things that I did right and definitely some things that I did wrong because you know how we do here at Thrift Diving. I gotta show you my mistakes, right? Okay, so what I did was I laid the plank in place and marked where the edge of the wall was. And remember, we have to keep the quarter inch gaps in mind. All around the perimeter, we need that quarter inch gap. So I marked the edge of the wall and then I used my tape measure and measure from that mark to the top and whatever that measurement was, it needed to match where the measurement was on the floor with the other board. Great. Now we have a measurement from the wall to the plank. Now here I believe it was like five and a half, five and a half, and I subtracted a quarter of an inch for the expansion gap, right? Now what I should have done was I should have rotated that tape measure and measured that five and a quarter from the other side of the board and not from the side to the left. I should have rotated it around. But look at what I did. I didn't do that. I actually just transferred that measurement right onto the board and that is going to cut out five and a quarter. That's not what I wanna do. I wanted to leave five and a quarter. So I should have measured from my left-hand side, which as you're looking at this video, that's your right-hand side. So guess what happened? When I went to cut this with a jigsaw, you'll see here, it's actually making a nice clean cut. So just to let you know, you can use a jigsaw or you can use a like a Dremel rotary cutter. Either works fine. But you'll see here, the part that's remaining is very skinny. And of course, when I go to fit it, guess what? It doesn't fit. <laughs> it's exactly what I did wrong. If I had taken that measurement from the other side, it would have left five and a quarter. So I made another cut and you'll see here that I've got a quarter inch expansion gap I think I do, and it fits much, much better than the previous board. So once I got that into place, I was able to angle it at 45 degrees, push it down, tap it into place, and then use the mallet to secure those seams. And it looked pretty good. Now the areas that are close to the wall, you're not gonna be able to use your tapping block. So use a pull bar, tap it a few times with your mallet, and it should close any space that's remaining between the planks. And here's another tip. When you're cutting the planks at the beginning and at the end of your rows, save those pieces that you cut because the piece that you cut at the bottom can be used as the starting piece for your next row at the top. And remember we did all that math at the beginning of the project? Well, this is why. When you get to your final row, you want it to be balanced. You don't want to have a skinny piece of plank that's like one or two inches. So this one, we were able to use one of the skinnier boards and it looks great. So now we are ready to finish off near the stairs and we've got a lot of irregular pieces. So using the instructions that I gave you before, that's how I made a lot of these cuts to get these pieces into place. And the part that was most challenging was trying to cut around the doorway. This was very difficult. So I forgot that I needed to cut this doorway trim and I slid a piece underneath the doorway just to see if it was going to fit properly. And then I took the measurements of the inside of the door. This is the transitional flooring piece that needs to go down, but it needs to be cut to length. So I cut it at 31 inches with my jigsaw and then I changed the blade on the jigsaw to a steel or metal cutting blade. This allows me to cut the little piece that goes underneath of the transition. This will actually get glued to the floor. I'll show you that in just a moment, but this is what it'll look like and it'll go over the edge of that flooring. All right, so next I needed to create a template. This was very challenging. I didn't know what cut needed to be made in order to fit underneath of this trim and not poke out. So I used scrap piece of paper and just drew a little quick template and then cut it out with my jigsaw. And I had to make a series of cuts here, so it looks a little funny. <laughs> but sometimes you're gonna get those kind of cuts underneath of the doorway. But the main thing is just making sure that when you slide it underneath of the trim, you don't see those cuts. So I slid it underneath and it looked pretty good, but my concern was whether I was going to be able to connect these boards together. Remember, in order to connect them, generally we have been putting them at a 45 degree angle, which helps to lock the boards together. 
and then we're tapping them into place to secure them. Well, here we didn't really have that maneuverability. So you'll see that I'm grabbing the boards in the middle, trying to just pull them as much as I can at a 45 degree, despite being underneath of the trim. And then I use a tapping block to finish it off. And surprisingly, it actually clicked together. So I was surprised it turned out so nice. And finally, my final piece, I had to make a couple of additional cuts here. You see the, the wood that's that's there by the uh, by the wall, but it wasn't a problem. Just use my jigsaw to do that and, and use the pull bar to secure it into place. Now, the final step was to put some construction adhesive on the bottom of the metal part that we had cut. This is the transitional piece to cover up the, the new flooring and the old flooring. And I just held it in place for a little bit and then taped it down. I didn't put anything on top of it, but you could put some weights or something so it doesn't slide around. And I started putting in some of the PVC trim. I'd removed all the previous baseboards because they were wood and I didn't really want wood down in a basement that could possibly have moisture. So the PVC works really well. I just used two inch brad nails with an 18 gauge brad nailer, used a little bit of trim uh, sealant, uh, some caulk in order to cover up those seams. And I didn't show it in this video, but eventually I go back and add a little wood filler filler to the nail holes, sand that smooth, and then painted it. So let's have a look at what this basement looks like. This is what it looked like before. And once the flooring was all done, this is what it looked like after. I could not wait to get the furniture in here and just make it look so amazing. And let's talk about price. How much did this actually cost me? Well, I paid about $2,000 out of pocket for the vinyl plank tiles and the trim was about $200. I removed all of the wood trim and replaced it with moisture resistant, waterproof PVC trim, which I think is excellent for basements and bathrooms. And then the caulking, the paint, those materials probably were about $50 to $100. Now, let's keep in mind, if I had paid Home Depot to install this, it would have cost probably about $2 per square foot. Well, I had about 600 square feet, so that would have been, well, you do the math, $1,200, at least $1,000 to $1,200. So doing it myself saved a bunch of money and it looks awesome. Love it. So you got to come back for the next video because I'm going to show you this big hole that was in my basement ceiling. And it took about three years for me to get around to fixing this, but I'm going to show you exactly how I fixed it. So if you want to connect with me on my blog, go to thriftdiving.com, subscribe, and I'll send you five eBooks printables, checklist, things that you will get just as a thanks for subscribing. And be sure to check out my project gallery. You'll see some more of the projects I've done and come back, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends. I love having you here and thanks for sticking with me for 22 minutes. See you next video.